welcome everyone to Oscar's home. Um, it's our evening feed and uh, interaction uh, with Oscar. What I thought I'd do was just talk a little bit about, um, from the point of view of training, um, doing things like target practice um, and target training uh, with otters, particularly Asian shore clawed otters. Um, and some of the experiences that I have. So coming up, I've got a couple of videos, um, some pictures, and uh, some slides and that sort of thing. So first of all, um, let me say hello. hello. Let me say hello first to Oscar. Hello. So while he checks that out, let me um, just say that um, uh, obviously target training um, is something that can, can be really, really beneficial um, from the point of um, training the otters to uh, go to certain places for inspections, um, to aid in veterinary inspections, all sorts of things like this in crate training, in weight training. I've seen videos of otters um, stood on scales. Really, all sorts of things develop um, from. Um, the target training um, and that sort of thing. There are different ways of going about it of course. Um, some people like to use some kind of stick um, with um, uh, like a rubber ball on the end that the otters have to reach up and touch. Um, other people, and personally my preferred approach, um, is just using your normal gestures, um, pointing um, and that sort of thing and developing a contact um, from the point of view of just using your hands and, and your gestures and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, as I've said, the target training is, is really, really beneficial. Um, but personally, I think um, it's good to be aware of the fact that it can also become something of a barrier. Um, I think if you just think for a second, um, it can actually um, become a barrier in the sense that um, keepers and animals sort of get locked um, in that set routine and that's those set rules of how it should be done rather than trying to break down those barriers and interact um, as normal as possible and um, without those sort of things, without the, the, the sticks um, and, and, and really just use your gestures and your hands and that sort of thing. Of course you have to bear in mind and I'm not oblivious to the fact that um, sometimes if you're dealing with um, let's say wild otters or otters that haven't got had a lot of contact or bigger otters where there is a bigger danger of being bitten and obviously the bigger the jaws, the bigger the bite, I accept all of that. Um, but where possible, and particularly with Asian short claws this can apply, um, I've got a few suggestions that maybe you can try um, and certainly this is the approach and my thinking um, behind the way that I did it um, when working with two um, Asian short clawed otters, um, Mia and Smudge and aquarium which you can see in the other videos. Now for a start whichever method that you use I think it's really really important to be aware of your body language. Okay? Now we've talked about the ways or I talked about the ways that often some people can communicate and you can hear that happening right now. Um, vocal sounds are incredibly important. Okay, um, he knows that there's something going on because I'm talking to you. Um, but normally when you use vocal sounds, okay, he doesn't speak English and I don't speak otter. Um, but we can communicate in the sense that we can understand the tones and there is a definite ability for them to... Um, here we go, we want to play right now. Um, to understand those tones and, and pick up the way that, that you're thinking and your approach to the situation. I hesitate to use the word feeling um, because obviously... Uh, when we get into that sort of realm, the, the, the feelings and let's say emotions are very, very different um, with otters. But nevertheless, you can still communicate. So, from that point of view, it can be used as a good bridge. Yes, it can. We're just eating cheeks again. Yes, we're eating cheeks. Yeah, we're eating cheeks. We get cheek ups in the face. Yeah, cheek ups in the face. Um, so, from that point of view, um, when you're target training, whichever way that you use it, um, you use what we call a bridge. Um, now some people again use a whistle. With a whistle it can be a pretty indiscriminate sound, it's not real, it doesn't communicate anything to 
the animal, if whatever you speak to them and communicate to them, they can pick that up. I know that he's happy, he's inquisitive by the sound he's making, and equally they can tell the way that you're feeling by the way that you talk to them. Higher tones or more soothing tones um, come across a lot better. Um, so whistling, again, you can kind of get lost behind that, I think. You can, you can, you can become something that, that, that doesn't really help in the end. Um, of course, you, you have some kind of reward um, for what you're doing as well. So the otter touches the, the ball, they get a whistle, they get a reward to let them know that they've done it. Now that's not to say, and I've always thought, it's better to use your own voice to build a relationship between the animal and the keeper to recognise when it's done well by using a good. Uh, there's a great video at the moment um, from uh, Potter Park Zoo, um, which I think is great, where that is actually being used, and that's certainly the approach that I took. Um, it's good, they can understand that. It's a bridge, it's a repetitive sound. So, again, the approach I would take is do away with the whistle, go with the sound. They can recognise it. If I say to him kiss, he knows what that means. Um, so they can remember that. Now, getting into um, the sort of the, the touch uh, training, um, the reason that I personally think it's better to try and go with and build up the use of pointing, go to a place, um, a repetitive place, a place they either know they get fed or uh, that sort of thing or, or inspected. Um, and really start small. Now remember, this is a long process. It's, it's not. It's not going to yield instant results. And also remember back to what I said that when after we're approaching situations, it can take them up to their fourth time of repeating that process for them to really get a handle on it. But start small. Now one of the methods that I designed, and it wasn't by accident that I actually did this, is developing. And you'll see this come up in a second. Is take, for example, a big log. Um, and place it somewhere where the surface is uneven, really so that it tips towards you as the keeper. Okay? Um, get the otters to go onto it, and then start feeding whatever it is, your mealworms or your tidbits that you're going to feed them. And do it in such a way that they have to stand up fully, but they also have to reach for it. Now of course, the, the, the platform is going to rock slightly, so extend your hand, they can place their paws on your hand. Now, obviously, you've got to be prepared for the first few times. There might be a little bit of a, 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 an offence caused by this, but eventually they'll get you learn. They'll, they'll learn to use your hand as a, a place to hold while they receive their food. It becomes useful. Okay, it becomes useful to them. And I think this is the key point: is starting off because let's face it. In the end, when it comes to an examination. They're going to have to be touched. You're going to have to make contact with them. Of course, they can be sedated, but sedation should be avoided at any, if at all possible, with otters, obviously, because of the difficulties in doing it. So, if you can break down the barrier, which I think simply is, to an otter that's not socialised, to an otter that's not socialised with humans, that's not hand reared, they really want to know what you're doing. Hey, you're touching me. What is this thing that you're touching me with? Now, of course, it comes back to the psychology in the animal world. That movement of your hands, and this is something I have to watch from around otters that are not familiar with humans, um, is, you know, their claws, they, 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 they can appear, this sort of motion, even to horses, can appear strange and, and kind of frightening and threatening. So always bear that in mind, but if you can break down that barrier, the contact is made, and your hands become useful, they don't become something alien to them, okay, so start with that sort of thing keep doing it, keep making that secure, then close your thumb, hold, build that in, so that again then they're getting used to the touch, they're getting used to that, um, that it's not something strange, it's not something that they have to fear. Um, then again, come back to sit somewhere and allow them to come up to you. Build this interaction so that just like you would with a cat and a dog, it wouldn't be something unusual, so it's not something that they're scared of. So the platform idea is, is I think, and you'll see in a moment, quite a good place to start. So build your platform so that it rocks slightly forward, they stand on it, and they have to use your hand to, to rest because the platform's going to rock, it's going to be unstable, and then give them uh, their food. You generally have to keep them in your pocket or something like that to be able to do this, but that's not by accident. So. Um, Try that and it'll, it'll 
actually break down um, the barriers. Um, now, what was interesting was, was over the time of working with Mia and Smudge, from them going from just seeing this as a source of food and pulling it out of trousers and, and, and that sort of thing, by the end, and you'll see this video in a second, um, now I understand with the signals that I get from him that the, this was going to go further, and you'll see what I mean uh, in just a second. Um, because, of course, remember, body language is very, very important to any animal. As humans, um, we've kind of lost the use. Hello, I'm, I'm talking again. I'm like, what is um, that's a good thing with otters, and you'll see a video uh, in a second again. Is again, they, they are creatures that that do like that contact. Um, nose contact is a way of making friends. They do that naturally, and if you encourage them, they'll do that. And it's another good way of building up a bond with them. Just kneel down and come up, touch your nose. They will. Um, they like that sort of thing. Um, but body language is incredibly important really important to animals. As humans we've lost that kind of use of it because of our developed language. Now when I say that otters can read you like a book, that is, that is true. Lots of animals read you like a book, horses, dogs, anything like that. Be very aware of your body language and your movements. What? I'm not speaking. I'm not speaking. very aware of your body language. Um, animals will recognise you by your body language. They use it so, so much to communicate with because they don't have English or any other language for that matter um, to talk with. Um, so their focus is on, yes, the sounds, um, but lots and lots of body language and obviously otters just smells, but they will read you like a book. So if you're doing target training, and I made this mistake many a time, is really think what your movements are. Be very smooth, be very precise, uh, very steady, and you'll get better results. And this applies to any animal, but really in the case of otters, they notice body language that you wouldn't believe. Um, so again, if you've got an aggressive otter, you're most likely doing something wrong, um, body language wise. So if you're going to go ahead with this, really, really, really keep that in mind. If you've got a stick and, and you're doing this, and somebody's talking, and somebody else is moving, and whatever, there's so many things that the otter is considering and watching, it just isn't going to work, or it's going to go wrong, okay? So very smooth, very precise, okay? Um, and eventually, um, you'll get there. And those signals will start to come back to you also. Um, and again, you will hopefully... Um, see uh, some examples of this um, coming up uh, in just a second. Okay, um, so hope you enjoy um, the rest of the video. Um, uh, thank you very much for watch watching. If any questions? Um, you know, please, please leave a comment or send me a message. Okay. What? What? Um, again when we're playing, I know it sounds random sounds. What is it? What is it? But the tone that we use savage. and the words that we use are familiar to him. So hopefully he can recognise when we're playing by the sounds that we make. Yes, yes, he knows. And actually you didn't used to do that growling sound.
you can get to a point where you can accept a certain amount, they will try and play. And the first start of that is usually some kind of bite. Yes, what? Isn't it? Some kind of bite. Yes, and you'll see that in the video in a second. Yes. So those signals get returned to you. Yes, they do. They play with us. Yes. The other problem that you have, of course, is to be part of the group, you have to follow what the group leader says. Yes. So if the group leader tells you, tells you that it's bedtime and you don't go, obviously you're going to cause offence. If the group leader says you can play now and you don't play, um, you can cause offence. Obviously that's a big problem for humans because working with us is because we can't do that. Um, but just be aware that, again, problems can arise just by the very nature of your interaction, uh, interaction with them. So really think about what you're doing. Um, if they want you to be part of your, their group, and they're coming up and they're playing with you, and you don't reciprocate that, maybe um, there's some kind of offence there. So watch their body language. Keep an eye on your body language. What are you doing? How are you moving? How are you approaching it? How are you holding your hands? How are you holding your shoulders? What sounds are you making? Are you using the right tone of voice? Um, and you, you should uh, get some get some results. What? What are you saying? Right? What are you saying? Sit So this is the contact that I mentioned, let them come up and touch your nose with theirs. Um, it's a great way to build a bond with them, um, if you can't do that initially then you can always just touch with your finger. It's a great way for them to obviously smell you, recognise you and it builds a very very strong bond with an otter. Now as a start point, if you're working with otters that have had little contact, for example Mia and Smudge um, were only the contact that they had was when they were fed, um, and they were even fed when they were cleaned out. So this builds up a lot of problems, the classic problems of them biting at your ankles. So what I wanted to do was to differentiate for them initially when we had food on us and when we didn't. So that's where the red cup came in and the white glove, just to give that clear indication that we could be something other than a source of food. So when we were feeding we wore that and we took them over to as you can see a couple of stations. Now this is the station that I said was kind of unbalanced so it, it rocked forward um, when they were using it, when they were stood on it. Um, now this is where the development came from of them having to use my hand to balance themselves. 
We also use these stations um, to get them to go there uh, on particular occasions. As you can see, it was initially um, takes them a bit of time to get hold of this, but once they do grasp it, they know that they get fed at a certain place, or you can point to it and they will run there. Uh, and as you can see, um, you can feed them. Um, you can have a number of these stations around the enclosure, and they do learn them pretty quick. Um, once they've uh, once they've got the general idea of point to that station and go to it, um, and then they uh, they get some kind of reward. Um, obviously, you want to differentiate between a feed station and another station, sort of an inspection station. Now, don't forget that otters really are very, very good at playing you at your own game, so don't think for a second that they're not thinking about it um, and they're not analysing you and uh, playing a game with you. As you can see from this footage here, um, if they think they're going to get food or to try and encourage you to give them food, they'll go to those stations. So always bear that in mind that sometimes they can force the issue and make sure they're not governing your behaviour, um, um, as they're very, very good at doing. Now again, this is the start point of um, just encouraging them to allow us to touch their food. Now balance um, the uh, uh, whatever tidbit that you're giving them away from them, so they need your hand as a support. It's a start point at least. Again, all the same. Now one of the things that I thought of was um, to give them an idea of what it feels like or how when they bite you um, is initially go back and touch them kind of in a way of saying um, if it's not okay with you it's not okay with me either so it really worked it reminded them that um, in the same way that when they did it to us we could do it back to them um, here we go we see the development again of them um, allowing us to touch their paws and as I said the focus with this really was to try and just break down those barriers um, and get them used to us touching them um, this wasn't something strange. It doesn't happen quickly, um, it's a slow process, but it can lead to uh, some amazing things once they uh, get comfortable around you. This is me um, doing a talk with them um, and they felt quite comfortable to come up and uh, and do this sort of thing. Now remember again, they're very good at analysing you, very good at analysing your body language. I think maybe on some occasions I should have been a bit more subtle with my body language, um, but this was something that we, we learned as we went along. They also got to figure out which pocket my, the food was in. Again, that shows you how well they think about things. Um, they don't miss a trick. So eventually they would just come up and try and take the food straight out of my pocket. Um, so again, if anybody thinks that otters aren't intelligent, um, that's a good example of, uh, of something else that they're able to figure out and problem solve very, very easily. So again, this just kept developing. They would hold for longer, get them comfortable around you then start to touch. One of the difficult parts is um, getting a hold of their paws, um, getting them comfortable with that, holding it for longer each time. Again, just getting them comfortable around you generally, in movements. And then finally, as I say, um, being able to actually hold and keep lengthening the time that you hold. And then your hands can become something quite useful for them. And you see with the cage training, um, uh, they're, they're not afraid of you, your hands, and they don't see it as something um, that's, that's strange. Now, here's an important point to also consider throughout all the work you do with the otters. It's something that Leslie Wright mentioned to me a long time ago. And this was about otters having difficulty with people because of our height and our size and also associating body parts with the parts that they consider you to be human. They have a difficulty connecting all the parts. Um, so, for example, if you walk into an otter's enclosure, let's see what that looks like to an otter. Okay, so we're going to illustrate that. So you walk in, you're speaking, you're doing what you would normally do as a human, but just imagine how it feels to an otter. You're speaking away, you're talking, Okay, and of course Oster has to inspect the camera, why not, of course. But just imagine, just see it from his perspective. Just see what he sees. Okay, so he's down there. All he can see are your boots. But he can hear you talking. He can hear the communication part of it. Just wipe that lens, there we go. That's great, hopefully you can still see. He still hears the sounds, but all he sees are 
well, in this case, my boots. I changed my boots. Um, but just imagine that for a second. If you were an otter within their group, there wouldn't be any issue with you being above him, psychologically, literally above him. Now think of it in human, uh, the human world, in places of authority, a court, the judge will sit higher. So, in some situations, to get into the group, to get into their mindset, lower down, go lower down, sit down, sit down on the floor, let them come up to you. You've got issues with them biting, um, and I'll speak more about that, because we're nipping, um, just close your fists, just sit with them, let them, let them, you know, interact with you, let them find you out, let them smell you. Um, you'll find often that once they've kind of thought they've figured you out, they'll probably leave you alone, um, and again, they'll go back to, they'll ignore you. Um, but just really think about that, think about their perspective. Now, the other issue that can arise with that, if we talk about detail, they will remember what you wear. So again, we try not to change our clothes too often that we use to come in here, um, obviously to retain the smells, the smells are very important. But also think about what we've just seen. Now, if you're starting to work with otters that haven't had so much interaction, you may find that they bite at your ankles, that's a common uh, thing that happens. Um, now, of course, people often then will wear some kind of protection, wellies, usually. Otters don't forget. So if they've seen wellies and associated that with some kind of control or let's say some kind of um, uh, oppression on their part, they will not forget wellies. They will not forget those items of clothing. So it could be that if you're experiencing problems, you just need to change your clothing, go for some, uh, some kind of protection underneath your trousers, that sort of thing. Um, you may find a massive breakthrough, but they really do not forget. So wellies, it can become... Um, a, a big issue. Now the interesting thing is um, is watching their body language. Um, this is them playing. Um, play real close attention to um, to what they're doing and how they um, they interact with each other because eventually they they will start to see you as part of their group and look to you in the same way. Now one of the things that we also did was develop a sound that we used um, to get them to go to a certain place and that was generally a whistle to get them their attention immediately if we needed it. And also listen to the sounds that they're making, the high squeaking sounds. So that whistle, that was something that they recognised and immediately come here. That's another sound you can develop. I remember lots of sounds um, to mean lots of different things. So, to come here and get some food immediately. Another sound just to indicate an, an affection. And this is them playing again. Look how they play with each other. Much smudge in the pool. Eventually you'll start to get these kinds of signals. Now it is difficult of course, yes I'm aware that they have sharp teeth, so um, it, you know there is that danger of you getting bitten. If you can trust them, and now that I see the way that Oscar plays, I can see that these signs were, were starting to come out with Mirror and Smudge. Um, now again, I think it's something that would have developed slowly, um, over a couple of months to a year, but eventually I think it's incredible to think that after having very little contact with humans in the space of sort of 9 to 12 months, how far they'd come along and how inherently playful and kind they were, never in that time did they ever intentionally try to savage me, let's say. Um, they, they were always uh, either just interested in food, um, that plays a big part, um, but just generally very, very kind, inquisitive, and playful creatures. So, that's the way that, we've well, seen the way that Smudge would try and play with Mia in the water. She would do the same thing to me.
and this was really towards the end of working with them um, and it's also good, I highly recommend people to just generally spend time in their enclosure, just watch them, get them let them get used to you um, so people are offended by the fact they think they're ignoring them, they're not, they're away there, they know you're there and then these kind of interactions start to develop and she's a smudge, she's of course group leader she instigates the play and just be with them watch them and you can learn a lot just by watching animals So eventually again she would come back and she would nip, say nip, just a really gentle, um, you always, it's difficult, you're always aware that they could potentially bite but it was a great start point um, to actually see this starting to come out, this kind of behaviour and interaction. And this shows you about sounds. We used to give them toys. Now, she sees the object, but initially wonders where that sound's coming from. That's not familiar. She didn't recognise that. Very attentive to sounds. Just touch their noses. There she is again. And she would play like this more and more. same way. And do circles in the water. Again, just the development of seeing that we're about more than just food. And see Oscar showing the same sort of signs, getting hold of one of our fingers. shows them again how playful they are. They do like to play tug. Um, now, the issue with their enclosure is, is they, they love clean straw. Um, they love a nice tight place to um, to curl up in. Um, they don't like a big area. If you have a big area inside, that's why this has like a, a hutch within a hutch. Um, if you have too big an area, they will start um, doing their mess in inside the holt. Um, but this gave them two choices and what we used to do was give them the cage and then also a cardboard box. Now they also like their smell so you can see in there we always or I always like to leave a little bit of straw left over from last time just to mix in with the new straw. Um, same applies to their droppings um, always leave a little bit don't make it too clean don't make it too unfamiliar they're scenting animals so scent, removing it all can leave them kind of distressed so um, um, I don't recommend you do that, I keep it familiar um, but any changes you do make um, just see them as a form of enrichment um, any, they're interested in whatever you're doing it's exciting for them you can hear the sounds they make they're great inspectors great adventurers
So if there's something going on, uh, they want to know about it, they want to help. <laughs> so generally what I'm saying is, is that never be afraid just to go in and out of the enclosure, do small jobs. Um, and as you can see, something like as simple as changing their bed can provide them with hours of fun. Um, this is Smudge doing a uh, rearranging, sort of scenting um, behaviour. We'll just get clumps of new straw and bring it out of the hole and then scent it. There she goes. Now it's also great if you can give them more than one place to sleep. If your otters, again, it, I think it's something that if you take the time to notice, if they are forced to sleep in one place, it can cause them some annoyance and they'll be thinking about this. So give them opportunities to, to find and make their own beds. Now again, you see this is a pool draining session, we'll clean it all out. Um, just leave them out, let them inspect, um, keep a good eye on them of course, but um, this is them wondering what's going on and it really does um, enrich their day um, to see something happening. They'll be in the pool and wondering what's going on. And again, you get an indication from the sounds they make. So whatever job it is you've got to do, um, ask yourself, is it something that they can be around while I do it? Because they'll love to watch you, um, they'll love to, uh, to help, as it were. And again, of course, um, this is just an example of how playful uh, uh, an enrichment toy here is just a piece of bamboo, we cut holes in it. Um, and uh, gave it to them to, to get all the tidbits out of um, and they find that great, really get their minds going, their problem solving brains, thinking caps on and this was right toward the end um, anyone could go in the enclosure with them um, you can just see my knee me knelt off to the right there but um, it was amazing to actually accomplish this um, that someone could go in, sit down, I could tell them what to do um, and they could feed them and interact with them and they'd come up and and uh, get on their knee if they could um, and and generally just be uh, very the friendly creatures that they are and people could see them like that um, a fantastic experience So those are just a few ideas, um, like I say you can comment or message uh, and I'll try and clarify anything that I've said, um, but uh, like I say just remember the detail, really think about everything that you're doing around them. Remember the smells, you know, sniffing things out there, remember the sounds you make, the movements you make. And watch how they react. And just remember, they don't miss a trick. There's something new in my enclosure. Thanks for watching. Thank you.
Okay, so coming up with some extra footage just to build upon some of the ideas that I've already um, talked about um, and give some visual examples and I'll talk you through them. But what I would say is a disadvantage for otters, particularly Asian short claws uh, in captivity, is that they are sometimes considered um, akin to small rodents. Um, that's a fact and therefore they're not capable of understanding, learning or communicating with their keepers. Therefore, um, and I guess this happens a lot with certain animals, there is an expectation that the animal learn from you, the keeper or the human. Um, now what I would say is if you're approaching working with otters is, is you really have to consider all the things that they remember, the sounds, you, your body language, all that sort of thing. It's very, very important. So, we always have to take safety very, very seriously. However, if you're building routines, and hopefully I can show this through this video, um, if you have a set routine and you slightly deviate from that, the lack of something happening that they expected to happen can cause problems. So the routine itself can become a problem. So it's a delicate balance between allowing them to understand you, learn your body language and you being clear and consistent so that they know that because they will recognize you and they will understand you. We we'll take for example you have a certain feeding routine if it doesn't happen the way that they expected it to happen that one time it results in a bite or something like that so really consider that you are communicating with them they are capable of that um, if we're doing it any other way um, I really uh, uh, struggle to see the point of it so take that into account um, maybe there's something with the routine that's making them angry um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at all of these things um, through this extra footage okay so first up um, I'll give you an example of some of the classic biting behavior um, that happens um, and this is really going back to the point I've made before the otters are very very good at forcing things um, forcing you to feed them. Now this is through biting, um, through the sounds that they make, and this is a, obviously a timed feed, um, so they know there's an expectation there, they're wanting their food, you are to begin with a source of food. Now uh, one of the things that um, I did was um, start wearing some kind of protection, like for example if you notice horse riding half chaps, um, get some of those, put them on underneath um, your trousers so it takes away the Wellington boot association that we've talked about. A lot of otters might build an aversion to those. Um, but put them underneath your trousers so it protects you slightly and really try not to react to their bites. It's very difficult of course, um, they can reach quite high up um, so really try to ignore them um, and just let them know that they're not going to force you in any way. Okay. Um, you're going to give the signal. We talked about what that signal can be. Um, now, I would personally still go with a vocal sound. They are capable of remembering that. As I say, a good um, is a good bridge rather than a whistle. One of the things that I'm convinced of, and you see an example of this is um, coming up later on, is that they remember the little things, um, even down to headsets, um, that sort of thing. Um, so if you're in a situation whereby you're trying to deal with them and you usually use a whistle as in a physical whistle in your mouth and you don't have it, that can pose a problem. So it's better to have that sound, uh, let's say library, internalized um, as something that you can use immediately um, to let them know whether they've been good or to let them know when there's food coming or not um, and, and continue that way. The other thing, of course, is that when you start out with them, then you may find that um, they still have that slight expectation um, to get food. So what I would suggest is, is um, obviously, you know, they they want their food. Um, slow down the time, particularly as you saw there, me sitting down with them. Um, the time between you um, feeding them. So if you're giving them mealworms, just 
give them one and then keep trying to slow that down each time so basically they learn that there's no need to be so agitated about the food it's coming they're gonna get it but it really is in these situations with talks and um, set talks the expectation really really builds up for them so again it's the routine becoming kind of constrictive and I kind of view it like you know, why can't we do something different? Why is there that expectation there? Yes, of course, the public want to see them, um, but try and build in different ways of feeding them using toys, that sort of thing. It was suggested to me that you should start with a large prey item if you're going to try and do some training. That's maybe a good idea, um, just to calm them down slightly, but again, there's no need for it to be straight away. As soon as you open the door, you walk in, you feed. Um, that can become problematic, so um, again, you see more and more examples, this is the early stages, um, and this is quite classic alter behaviour, it's just really them governing you and the keeper's um, behaviour. You can see the use of one of the toys there. Um, again, um, the rock in the middle was one of our primary feeding stations, um, and obviously we trained and we pointed to this. Again, they can recognise the point gesture, which station to go to, um, so we had this one and another one, um, and uh, we used to take them there. And it was also good for the um, public to see, and this is the feeding station, as I say, that used to wobble, um, so eventually we moved on to them having to use our, put our hands um, to balance on it so we could um, get them. Um, used to us touching them and, and touching their paws and things like that. So again, you can see the expectation is there. Um, and this is the early stages of the training and um, again, I'm getting familiar with them. Um, they're getting familiar with me. Uh, I did say that I think reviewing the footage, and this is why it's so good to set up a camera, so not only can you watch them, but you can watch themselves, you can watch yourself. Um, is I should have been a little bit more subtle and hopefully you can see that develop to later footage um, be a bit more clear about your the, the actions that you use of course if you're speaking this can be difficult um, particularly if you like me use your hands a lot in speaking again you can see the classic chase people out the enclosure behavior and now on to the sort of the pointing they know what it's about um, you can also obviously uh, couple that with the whistle so, that means feed um, again so all of these things um, really try and enforce that they don't get fed until that um, that sound comes that is the feeding signal okay so they're not getting fed unless they hear that it's your decision um, and they will um, learn that although I did say um, they don't so much like the decision-making process being taken away from them uh, on that front um, because obviously they don't get their food from anywhere else um, yeah I think you can make that one and you can make that quite clearly now again this is making them stay making them realize that that's the station they're not going to get anything out of coming and biting you and just keep reinforcing that it is difficult at the beginning obviously you look at them you hear the sounds they're making um, they can really uh, try and force you to do things and try and force you to come up with the food straight away but it's a slow process but it does work you just have to keep reinforcing that so stay they're not going to get anything out of it and again um, if they bite the other thing that can be a problem is they may not realize they're actually hurting you or could potentially hurt you when they're doing that so to get their attention and this is quite controversial but quite frankly I don't care um, is touch them back um, and you don't have to hurt them, just touch them back. A lot of the time if you're working with otters and you can do it safely and you're quick enough with your responses, which I am, um, you can touch them back um, and that just reminds them that that is making contact. So again, you can see here, um, they get to the point then that they remember, they've figured it out, hey, if we go and stand on that, um, that station, we're gonna get fed as quick as possible. Now again, this comes back to another point, they soon start to understand the routine and they soon start to play you at your own game there's an expectation there they learn it inside out um, so really um, bear that in mind and once they've figured that out that that's the feeding station you can start to surprise them again you can start to let them know that it's not always about feeding that's not what we go into the enclosure for we need to go into the enclosure to clean obviously 
and then you can get to the stage where they're just happy for you to be around um, and this does quite quickly happen, they stop seeing you as just um, as a source of food so here we go again um, the large prey item and surprise them change things about remember sometimes it's the routine itself um, that can cause uh, problems and again I think getting them to think um, see it as a form of enrichment as long as it's you're very clear in what you're doing with them um, there isn't a problem so again here we sit down with them um, really to be honest they are just um, at first interested in the, uh, the food and you can see oh, there's an expectation there from Smudge that she should be getting fed there so again touch back look oh actually we're going to go and stand on that station because we might get food there so again you can really see how they understand and how they play you now this is interesting very clear recognition don't underestimate the body language that they understand you can see that clearly there um, are able to recognize signals and figure things out and what you should spend a lot of time doing again this comes back to the point of if they're biting you you just have to ignore them um, I used to just go in and clean the enclosure put a headset on if you're talking to people outside the enclosure why can't you talk to people from inside the enclosure there's no difference and in fact it helps see it as a form of enrichment that's exactly what it is um, and while you're in there if you have some kind of tidbit on you, like mealworms, um, and I used to carry the mealworms around in my pocket, um, I don't care what anyone says about that, to be honest, it used to work, um, it was handy, um, give them a mealworm, and then walk off. Um, it's again, it's, it's giving that indication to them that, hang on a second, he just fed us, but we didn't bite. Okay, um, now some of you might say, well again, you're causing frustration, you're causing friction. I think what it is actually just enforcing is, is that you feed them on a clear signal, and that signal is whatever you choose it to be, be it a or a point or a particular station. That's what it's about, and they will remember that. So go ahead, um, just go into the enclosure. At first you may face problems, but the key is persevere. Stop them um, from doing it. Now here you can see I've started a talk. There's people at the enclosure, now watch their reaction. Now this in itself um, can become a problem. Hang on, he's talking. You've seen, obviously, the examples with um, Oscar, that he, he found it unusual that I was talking. These guys here, remember the headset. I start talking, they immediately associate that with a timed feed. So again, help going into the enclosure, cleaning, um, doing this sort of thing, um, can start to break the associations and the attachment to a routine. Here we go, Mia, even resorting back to biting. He's talking. Is it a timed feed? Um, and that's what they're thinking. They, they're associating all of these things. So by you, by, by you going into the enclosure um, and, and just cleaning up and doing all of these things can stop the bad behavior, or help to at least, here we go, Mia's gone onto a feeding station. Maybe if I go there, he'll feed me. Smudge has decided to come up and onto the uh, the halt there and, uh, and and start making some sounds. But see Mia, she sat over there, she's waiting. It isn't a feed, you know that. But they think it is. And there goes Smudge. So you can see this quite clearly, how clever they are at understanding these routines and building attachments to them. and all I'm doing is talking. Why can't you go into the enclosure, put the headset on and talk to people from inside the enclosure? There's no reason really, is there? And you can see them again. We'll come up, we'll go and stand on the inner station. Maybe you'll feed us if we stand there. going about cleaning you're not feeding that's not what it's about at all and soon you'll start to break those associations but really really um, persevere 
again, we're on the station, maybe he'll feed us. I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll go and have a look in the cupboard. Now, this is one thing that um, always used to fascinate me about them, was um, uh, the great explorers. Um, so they used to take every opportunity to, um, to go and have a look uh, in the cupboard at the back in the two-door system. Um, and I think that was a sign for me that um, if they were doing that, the attention was off me, um, and uh, we were actually getting somewhere. Investigating. It's always good for them. Um, let them explore. There's no harm in that as long as they can't get out. Now again, you pick this object up and they start thinking you might fill it. But this is the perfect example. Sometimes I just used to go and stand in the enclosure. Just doing nothing. Why not? Hold your arms. Just watch them. This can confuse them a little bit initially, but it really shows you just how much um, they're looking at you, they're analysing you and they're the things that they've associated you with, which unfortunately a lot of time is just food um, for otters that haven't had a lot of contact. And again, this is a good example of uh, the cleaning the enclosure itself just being a form of enrichment. They're happy to help, they just want to investigate things um, and play with the tools that you're using. And obviously lots of different smells and ways. Um, so this is what I used to spend a lot of time um, doing spending time with them and don't think for a second that they're not still watching you and they're not getting used to your um, body language it's not alien to them then um, I think this is a problem as well really just look at the amount of time you spend interacting with them going back to the routine if you just only interact with them at certain times not only does that routine become a problem and um, the set feed and the set talk they really don't get any other time to understand you um, and, and, and really become familiar with you and what you're about and the way that you move. Consider that for a second. You're, you're confusing to them. Um, but they will start to see repetitive things from you and they will start to understand it, the way you move uh, and that sort of thing. So this can really help. Is, um, what I used to find is that they would just, a lot of the time, just come and, and lay somewhere near me and just watch. Um, so again, this comes back to um, what I was saying about you can learn a lot just by watching them, and they certainly did. Um, and then they go off exploring again. And then they come back. And you sort of stand there and watch. Quiet times uh, in your establishment. And of course, he's good for the enclosure. Okay. 
mana? Hmm, saya nak cuba. Sama ni kita semua masukkan dalam kuali tahu tak? Kuali cina naik lah, lebih rendah. Di lap. So here again, we're back to what would normally be a set B. Now they're sat on the station, they're expecting me to go straight to them. Oh dear, didn't quite work out like that. So again, this is just enforcing the feed on that station. And this is something that, if you have members of staff, you can all agree on a sort of base routine so that um, everyone can participate and establish certain things. So that becomes your feeding station. If anybody else wants to deviate from that and have more contact with them, then that's fine. But the members of staff that don't, they can still feed quite easily. Um, and they obviously use the same signal as important usually um, and they can also then go into the enclosure and then they can start feeding so we have a sort of a base routine um, that everyone can stick to so to stop them doing that we have to give them some other indication when they're going to get fed and fortunately sometimes it can be with things if uh, the door opens the sound bit is that they're very actually they're going to get fed every time so we make a point of trying to come in here and do other things other than feed okay you know put some good things tidying up that sort of thing just to stop them fighting because they're not going to get that really um, and you probably heard there when they came in give them a signal you know they're going to get fed and then again you can give them another signal to say it's in good Now, this again is um, going to be a set talk. Um, and you can surprise them with things like this. Uh, and again, this is good to build um, certain, um, or, or building the fact that you're making a decision about the, the feeding time. So surprise them by going and standing somewhere else and getting someone to help you. So you can see I've gone off camera. Initially, they were thinking, if we go and stand on that base station there, um, we're going to get fed. Get someone to help you. This is somebody else at the door, the, uh, the door that we come in, pointing to them and sending them away. So you're enforcing the command from each person. Okay, look, they're looking at me, they're looking again. Keep telling them where to go. So they learn the command. And the person, i.e. me, I'm off camera at the moment, um, I'm standing very still, not making any commands at all. You see them looking? Yeah, very closely. They're watching all the time what's going on. Just to reinforce the command. Here we go again. We'll go back to the feeding station. Maybe if we stay here, this is where we get fed. Still watching. Left and right. Looking at the door, looking at me. Of course, I haven't made any action at this point. Get them to stay there. You know they haven't accomplished anything by moving, by going to the door. You can also, obviously, at this point, start talking. But the talking doesn't necessarily mean feeding either. Remember that. Enforce that. Just because you're talking doesn't mean feeding. Maybe we'll try moving again, slightly. You can see them watching and thinking all the time. Don't ever underestimate that. We're probably going to go to the other feeding station. Here they come again. It's not quite time for feeding yet.
So again, back to me just sitting with them. Um, again, just to change the the, the feeding. Um, once again, a bit of enrichment. The crickets there. Quite good for them. Now again, you can see an example here. It's not to say that things don't go wrong. Um, but uh, I have to say, in all the time that I ever sat with them, like in this instant, um, they never ever, when they could have done, savaged me. It never happened. Okay. Um, again, you see them walking away there. Um, so Smudge is going to come up and try and get me to feed. And that can become quite a big thing, is obviously the sound that they make. Um, and this. And then you can see, I know all the people are here, I've got the headset on, I'm talking away, it's feeding time. And eventually you can see we started to enforce the idea that there was nothing to be gained by coming up and biting us. And just keep extending the time that they stay on the station. There's no good in moving from there because they're not going to get um, that food. And it really, in the end, starts to calm them down. As I say, there's no reason for them to be so het up, particularly if they're getting the right amount of food every day. It's really just the routine. That's not to say that they won't try it occasionally. When you can see this, look, that's all it is. I just think you're going to feed them if they do it. It doesn't work. They know exactly what they're doing, is my point. And now we feed. The point. As, uh, as ever, so you need to keep persisting. Just keep persisting. Eventually, you get through to them. Biting now because there's no, nothing to be gained from biting. there eventually. And again, the feeding times could be any time during the day. Um, it really is just a scenario and the feed itself, um, the people, the headset, the talking, that makes that um, anticipation grow. Um, and that's all it is. It's just about the situation that you're in causing these problems. Um, but they know it's feeding time. So and they resort to biting and get their food quicker. Just keep building that time, just keep reinforcing. Yeah. 
Can you see how clever they are here? I'm going to stop the biting, but... I can go from station to station. But really all the point is, is to stop and break that association between biting and getting food. Well, obviously, the accidents can happen with the biting. Um, so, we really need to break that association. So again, uh, just another example of working on lengthening the time between the feed starting, you opening the door and going in, and you actually giving them the food item. Now incidentally, uh, and you really, some people might have been watching these and thinking, um, oh, you know, you shouldn't be doing that, you're prolonging it. Uh, it's really only the situation that um, that, that causes this. Um, if you don't believe that, then if it's okay with your institution, your, your establishment, um, then change the feeding times. And some of these were actually feeding times that I staged um, and made extra um, to help with the training um, to vary things. So if you have two feeds a day that are advertised, obviously it's difficult, you need to try and stick to those, add in extra ones, move them, um, change the times, um, make people aware at the beginning of the day that the times have changed, um, and then obviously contrast that with going in first thing in the morning and seeing what their reaction is. It really is just the scenario, it's seeing the people, it's seeing the headset, it's seeing you talking that causes this. Um, so as long as they're getting the right amount of food, they're not as hungry as they sound. Um, it's just, again, the anticipation and the expectation that starts to build up. If they know the right amount of food is coming over the course of the time, you lessen that anticipation. It's really about getting them to a plateau where they know food is coming. If you're working with otters that haven't had the right amount of food, and this does happen a lot, and the right amount of food, by that what I mean is not just the weight, but also the type, if otters are deficient in something, they know it. Um, and if they're not getting the right spectrum of diet and they're deficient in something, it can make them angry. They know they need something because they can't get it, they can't forage for it, they need it from you. Um, so also consider that as a very, very important point. Um, are they getting the right diet? If so, yes. Initially, you may need to bulk the food up um, quite a lot and it may seem like they're gorging themselves on the amount of food that's coming but that's only because it's been slim in the past once they get to a point where they know the food is coming they're gonna get it each day um, you get off that that sort of anticipation and so much excitement and you can see with that footage there it's a prime example they have stopped biting they have stayed on the station they know they're not going to get anything out of biting it's not going to accomplish anything and you've broken a very very big um, a big thing, a big reaction and that's that's the object, uh, Again, I use these sort of things this that I made for here. them. Um, this is a very simple piece of bamboo. You can seal each end, and bamboo is great because it has compartments in it, so you can drill holes in it. One end, you obviously can keep air tight, um, so that react, sort of acts like a bit of a bob, um, so it won't sink fully. You can make one, it? obviously sink if you want. Um, 
But um, these ones just used to bomb and throw us around in the water, so you can use these as feeding tools as well. But each time, to let them know the food is coming, remember, they will recognise the object itself. Um, I have been advised um, before, and it's quite a good idea really, is you can also use a box. Physically take a box in, close the lid as a signal of feeding time over. It's the same thing, they'll pick it up, they'll remember it. Um, but um, with that thing again, it's just association with an object. If the object isn't there, if you move that object, um, then they obviously know there's no food coming. Same as the red cup, the white glove. Um, but again, we just try to boil it down to a sound and a station and a point. Again, this is just some um, footage from the past. Um, it's feeding time. Um, they're expecting it to go in a certain way. Um, I'm just not doing that, I'm just not playing the game. Um, and there they go. Stay on the station there. And then point where you want them to go. But keep in mind, obviously, that all of this time that you're interacting with them, um, particularly obviously with Mir and Smudge, they have very little contact to begin with, um, and there's obviously lots of otters like that. They're really preliminary steps, but at the same time, um, they're remembering your body language, they're remembering you, they're getting used to you as much as um, you, you are getting used to working with them. Um, and once these things are established, like no biting, and the signals, that sort of thing. And you see here, you can just move on to other sort of general interaction with them. Um, they're really not interested in savaging you. Um, and you see here, I've just brought in a different object to start the talk with. Um, and they've stood on the station there. Um, for long the time. They know they're not going to get anything out of coming and biting you. Again, I go back to the shame of it is, is that we as humans tend to look at it through our paradigm. Biting is obviously, wow, if somebody's bitten me, it means aggression, it means all those different things, it denotes an anger. Um, you know, yes, you could come off badly if an otter bites you, and particularly with larger otters, I'm completely and utterly aware of that. Um, but a lot of the time these bites aren't meant the way you think they're meant. They're really just a means to an end. Um, to the otters, and I think obviously you can see that um, with this here. If they accomplish something by it, they'll um, continue with that. And again, you can see they know that the uh, food is in that pocket. So bear that in mind as well. Once you've established one thing, you move on to the next thing. Um, you know, are they getting used to which pocket the food is in? Because they will. And again, then you can start to call them. And this is really building that idea that with a whistle and a point, they go to a certain place and this will eventually obviously move on to things like box training um, and station training for inspections and what I think the advantage is it's all built in, it's recognisable, it doesn't require a whistle, a physical plastic whistle in your mouth to do, it doesn't require um, the, um, the, the ball and stick method um, which uh, obviously again is something that other people use but I think it's a very sort of unpersonal element and there's so many things happening with that you've got the object itself you've got it moving around if you don't use it properly and clearly it can cause more confusion than it solves and then finally obviously towards the end um, you can see once they've got off that plateau of being so excited about food you just start interacting with them on a sort of a more general um, level um, and they become less concerned, I should think is the right word, about where their food is coming from. And once you've established these things, then uh, as you've seen in the other video, the play starts to come out, they start to understand your movements, you're not alien to them, um, and, uh, and therefore um, you can develop uh, those other um, kind of cues with them. 
Now that's not to say on top of all of this that um, one thing is again I come back to um, otters read you like a book. If you have members of staff that are scared of them uh, it's really not a good idea to um, let them in. Um, otters do play on that and I think they do find it kind of funny um, to, uh, <laughs> to take the Michael as it were. Um, so if someone is scared um, you really shouldn't be working with them. Um, you've got to be confident, you've got to be clear um, and if they see that you're scared and you show any signs of nervous nervousness they, they will play on that. General principle of animals really, um, they pick up on nervousness. So again, actually here, what you see is um, them just becoming very relaxed. Um, Mia's just having a snooze there. Um, they get used to the fact that they're going to get some food. Um, they know that it comes with a point. Um, so they know it's coming. They know it's coming on that signal. When it, that signal isn't being given, um, there's really no point in pushing things, really. Um, uh, so they're quite happy to uh, smudge over there. She's, uh, she found a mealworm, I think. Um, it's probably been scattered around, but mostly just a lot more relaxed about the situation. Again, that's just a, uh, another thing to consider is um, obviously physically showing them um, that you've got no food in your hands. Sometimes I think, uh, again, at one point, they can think that food develops out of thin air. <laughs> so uh, keep that in mind. You can see here, sitting down with them again, but um, I think this is Mia. Um, one of the things that can be advantageous is um, is if you have two otters, consider that they do compete for food um, and therefore it can be good to split them up and you'll see a different reaction from each one and more willingness to um, to sort of to get into the training and that sort of thing. You can also see there, um, again a controversial point um, if people disagree with this because at the end of the day you are alien to them and one of the things that animals have particular, particular difficulty with I believe is your hands they really don't understand the human concept of touch or touching um, but at the end of the day at some point they are going to have to be touched so if the first time you touch them is at a stressful event like um, being caught or, or being inspected um, it's more about they don't understand what's going on with your hands so if you can really sort of enforce into them that there is no danger from your hands and there's nothing to be scared of it really will go a long way if you don't agree with that that's fine but I look um, at it that um, if I was training a horse and I take it to a show and it's the first time I show them a fence um, <laughs> they're not going to understand it and they're going to be scared of it so you need to um, build these things in and you can get there uh, eventually um, obviously you'll have a certain amount of uh, bureaucracy within your establishment I have no doubt about that whatsoever um, but the fact of the matter is is at some point they're going to have to be touched and if you can avoid going to or if you can avoid that being stressful um, and you can avoid things like euthanasia then I think it's a good point to try it Now you can see here, um, I'm trying with smudge um, while this is going on um, to get into the touch um, with this footage here. I had just been training Mia um, to allow me to touch her paws. Uh, now again it's about perseverance and just being confident in your own ability to um, move your hands quite quickly. Really what smudge was here was uh, angry about the fact that she'd been separated uh, from Mia but just keep persisting um, and keep going at it, keep showing that there's nothing to be scared of um, in doing so and you'll get there eventually
the other thing of course to remember is is that like with Smudge she uh, was 12 years old um, when we started trying to do this um, so she's had an entire life of none of this contact that you have to get through um, which is a shame but um, just by persevering um, you can accomplish a lot Now this is on to um, some of the box training. Um, this was again one of the first times that they'd ever seen a box other than when they were caught to bring them here. Um, again, you can see new objects. This shows with otters. Um, they open the door and they might be expecting feed or something like that, but here we have a new object for them to inspect. Now again, one of the things that I really thought about was this is obviously an alien thing to them. Um, otters in general obviously don't like being cooped up and that decision making ability being taken away from them. The other thing I thought was what do they think about the box? What do they see from their perspective? And I realised that it's not just the box itself but again the problem that they have with understanding movement um, and the concept of the mechanism of the door itself. Um, it was really something quite strange. You see that they look at it every single time. So what I decided to do was allow it to become some kind of puzzle. Put the box in and put the food inside. Uh, and if you have a box with a big mechanism on it for opening uh, initially, and obviously I'm aware that you have to be careful with this because they could try and open it. Um, or be frustrated if they get in and they can't open it but initially just leave the door slightly ajar and let them get used to the door mechanism itself just swinging open to get in and get their food and make that a puzzle so they start to understand and feel comfortable with the mechanism itself then obviously um, if you have a big enough latch you can start to um, get them into it and just see again um, another copy of uh, uh, smudge there the uh, touch back idea So while you're training each time, you can just uh, revert on to something else to, um, to reinforce. So go from something just quickly um, to, uh, to reinforce it. And then you can see here, start off with uh, short movements inside the box. And put it back down again. And let them back out. Now, if you had, like I say, go back to, if you have a box with a big enough mechanism in it, but there's also some way of disabling that mechanism so it doesn't always work, um, I think it's better for them to get into a situation where they can open it themselves, but you have like an extra clip that you can put through it to stop them doing that. It's better for them to feel like the mechanism itself isn't working, them sort of touching it with them paws, it isn't working, than it is for them to feel 
um, that uh, they're cooped up and the stress of that itself. Um, each time, obviously, you can prolong the time between removing your clip and letting them out. Um, you can just keep, so again, they just come to focus on that they do have that ability to open the door if they want to, but you're just prolonging the space between it happening, and they get a reward of the tidbit of food when it happens. Um, so again, that's all we try and do with them, is just keep prolonging time, and otters, they work 10 to the dozen, um, so just keep prolonging time. So if you get them into a box, they know they've got that ability um, to open it, and then eventually, obviously, you can build that onto a signal, so the door, they open on cue. So it becomes, a, I guess, a bit of a game for them. Um, but again, you give them that, that ability to be able to do it themselves. Try that. See how you get on with it. Um, I felt that it was better for them to be able to do that. I have some sense that they could do that um, than it was um, for, it, for the, basically for it to be taken away from them at all. The other thing that can help, of course, is a more open cage. Um, and again, the mechanism on this, I'll let them play with that and put food inside and let them open it and close it and whatnot. So they got used to it. Uh, but again, you can really start to use your point and whistle um, with this sort of thing. And again, you have to start off small. Um, just get them to come in slowly, get them used to that individual box in the middle. Never underestimate that as with Mia here you can kind of see that she's thinking well why should I go into the box to get food a little frustration bite there when I could just jump on top of it um, and you'll see that coming up in just a second which always fascinated with them fascinated me with them um, this their ability to think like that um, just keep encouraging them in a new object is, is always strange to them just get them familiar with it working towards the end of the box and you can start to close the door with them inside if you have it on a bit of string at one end and you can do that quite easily and then bring them right to the end so if you ever did need to catch them um, you can do it quite easily Again here you just see me interacting with them, not always about food, I'm just quite happy to do that. And again each time you um, you start to interact, you see I uh, built this one into a talk um, and you see they've gone straight onto the station there. Um, what really uh, I'm going to do is uh, change the talk around so it becomes about the cage training. Um, there's no harm in that, it makes it different for them each time. And obviously it lets the visitors see um, what, you, what you're actually doing with them and some of the work that you do with them. So here this time we've got the door fully open. And immediately um, you go straight in. Apart from here of course who thinks it might be best just to go and look in the cupboard. <laughs> Well, the key point is, if you're noticing with this, is um, they're not trying to bite. Um, that association has gone. And you can stage uh, these talks. And make them extra to your set feeding times or incorporate them into your set feeding times. But um, really allow the public to see what's going on.
again feed them by the door um, <laughs> this is me why don't I just jump on top of the box that's easier um, so they get really get used to that door mechanism it really doesn't become anything strange and the key thing is is that obviously again one otter might be different to the other one otter obviously um, well they will be different, every otter is different but one otter will be different in how they approach the training and how they accept it initially so you have to bear that in mind um, again here just leave the door slightly closed so even just with you can see smudges inside even just by mere touching the door and moving it um, the sound is there, the movement's there um, so she gets used to the fact that the door moves And then again, you can just keep reinforcing it. Me is still thinking it's easier if you just jumped on top of the cage. Just keep reinforcing. You'll get it eventually. And there you go, until she's fully comfortable with it. And just keep that in mind that every otter is different. And again, we're going to move the, uh, the door mechanism. Be able to touch it. And, uh, and finally end up with them both inside at the same time. And then of course once they've got it fully it's just about time and perseverance and keep enforcing and they'll understand it.